Is mic on? All right. Hey, thanks, Kayla. Appreciate it. Uh, pleasure to be here. Um, you know, this is the most people I've ever presented to, so I'm really excited. You know, this is awesome. Uh, no, but thanks for coming. Um, I figured I'd start off by uh, taking you through a few different things, tell you a little bit about Jive, um, who we are, what we do, so you have some context as we go through, you know, my story, go through a little bit about uh, my background, and then take you through uh, fundraising and acquisitions, which is what I've spent a lot of time on at my time at Jive. Thought that might be interesting to, uh, to you guys. Just out of curiosity, who, you know, runs a business or has run a business or is planning on running a business um, right now? Okay, good. So this hopefully is, is somewhat relevant. Um, talk a little bit about how I, uh, what I've learned about managing my day to day, and then uh, leave some time for uh, question and answers at the end. So with that, uh, the Jive story. So what is Jive? Um, our board member, one of our board members, Roger Sipple, uh, he founded Informix. They went head to head with Oracle back in the day. Um, he, he says, uh, Jive is what communications would be if the internet came before the phone. Um, so basically we've taken your business communications and moved it to the cloud. So instead of having a, um, an auto attendant that comes out of a box that's on site, that you know, when you call into a business it says press one for sales, two for support, you know, three for customer service, whatever. Um, we've moved that box to the cloud. You know, voicemail used to be a machine that was on site. We moved that to the cloud. Um, basically we moved all these features to the cloud. Um, and uh, what that does is that enables us to, uh, every new feature we roll out hits the cloud, hits all of our customers, every business immediately. We don't have to do expensive truck rolls to maintain your phone system. There's not this you know, weird box in a corner uh, that you have to worry about. Uh, we ship you a phone, you plug it into your internet, and you're, you have a full feature grade phone system, business, business feature phone system. So pretty cool. Um, you know, a few of the things that we do, uh, a lot of businesses don't realize it, but they have a contact center. So they have a, they have a sales force, right? They've got a sales team or a support team. And uh, historically, um, you have to pay 100 bucks per person per month to get contact center type technology. And that's, again, something that you gotta pay uh, for separately. It's expensive. Sometimes there's hardware involved. We do, because we are so integrated with your, uh, your phones, your traffic, we can, um, we put together a contact center solution where all companies today can, for, you know, way, way, way less price, they have access to uh, how many sales calls they actually missed that day, uh, how many people are waiting in queue and for how long. Um, this kind of value add to a business that a lot of small businesses today, they can't afford an expensive contact center, but they want to know what's going on with their business, you know, who are they missing calls from, uh, how much more revenue could they get if they were able to, to tackle all the, all the calls that day. So. Things like that. We also uh, have an integration layer, an API layer, where um, let's say you are a marketing um, company and you want to run these campaigns on certain phone numbers. You want to see how it's done, uh, how a, a certain marketing campaigns have done. You can uh, integrate with our phone service uh, through our API layer and you can customize your information to see um, how, you know, different campaign, SEO campaigns have done or if you have kind of survey campaigns, how those have done. So a lot of things that we've done to, to, to make telephony cool, right? Because it's a pretty, it's like a hundred year old technology that, that we've basically completely duplicated all the features and functionality in 10 years in a SaaS environment, software environment. Um, you can use our service on a desk phone. You can use it on your mobile. We have a mobile app. You can use it on a computer. So you can just pull up your computer. You can be on, uh, you can make phone calls from your computer with Jive and you can collaborate from Jive. Um, one, of, one of the places we're going is something called Jive Me, if you're familiar with Join Me, where you can screen share uh, with you know, someone uh, on another computer. Um, Jive.me is kind of where we're, we're wrapping in all of these different types of communication. So there's calling, there's texting, but there's also screen sharing, there's video. Um, one cool product we have is called uh, Visual Conferencing. I don't know if you've ever seen the video of uh, a conference call in real life. It's pretty hilarious, but it kind of depicts what it's like to, um, to, to make a conference call. And so you have uh, people that, you know, you've got to dial a phone number, you dial a long pin number to, to get into the conference, then you say, oh, Sam has joined the conference. And then, uh, you know, you've got dogs barking and blenders running and people dropping in and out and you've got, you know, air, you know, traffic uh, kind of noise in the background. You know, all of that we solve uh, via our solution. So we show where the sound's coming from, you can mute, you know, anyone where noise is coming from, you don't want noise to come from, you can kick people out. 
Uh, I don't know if you've ever been on a conference call where someone's put it on hold. You've got this hold music going and everyone's on a call and there's just hold music going. But that's happened to me plenty of times. So you can kick that person off and get rid of the, the hold music. So pretty cool, uh, pretty cool technology. I'm excited about it. Uh, you know, a little more about, about that. It's, we're in a huge space. It's a $30 billion industry. Telephony, right, it's kind of boring, but it's, I mean, it's a massive space. This year, cloud telephony passed your traditional telephony. So for us, that's pretty exciting, pretty cool. Um, so that's, that's a little bit about Jive. That's the space we're in. Um, that's what we do. Uh, this was our first office. It was actually in the basement down there. Um, <clears throat> it's pretty ghetto. But the cool thing was we were next to Arby's. So <laughs> breakfast, lunch, dinner, you know, just hop over there, get some roast beef. You're good to go, you know. Um, today, we're in a uh, much nicer facility. Um, we're going to do over 100 million next year in revenue. We have, you know, we'll have 650 or so employees at the end of this year. So we've grown a ton. When I joined, we were doing, uh, like she said, 300,000 300, a month. So 200x. Um, it's been a really fun ride. And um, you know, the thing that I attribute this most to is this is another quote by Roger Sipple, just an awesome guy. He's a professional gambler too. He's like really cool. He's a really cool older guy that's just, he's just awesome. Quotable every board meeting, he's got a quote and we, this is one of them. But he said, the more people you have that can do important things, the more important things get done. And when I think about Jive, I think of the founding group. There were six founders. Um, uh, they all have a different skill set, right? And so they can each do an important thing and they could do an important thing at the time to help Jive get where it is today. So a little bit about the, the founding team. Jive uh, originally was actually a custom software design shop. Um, so there was this company called Agile Studios and they were uh, building custom solutions and they went to get a phone system and they said, uh, phone system, you gotta buy you know, $50,000 worth of equipment and this is ridiculous and we're software guys. We don't, we don't like talking to each other anyway. Let's just build our own phone system. So they built their own phone system, and some of their customers heard about it and uh, asked, say, well, hey, can we, you know, we don't want to pay 50 grand either. Can we use what you're using? And from there, the light bulb came on and said, hey, let's just start a whole new company. We'll call it Jive, and, uh, and we'll go from there. So uh, the six founders, um, you know, great guys, didn't pay themselves originally. And a couple of years is when I came in, and uh, I think they were, you know, they, uh, they partitioned out payroll based on who had the most kids and kind of, you know, the circumstances. It was, I think, around 1000 bucks a paycheck, something like that. Um, so I think pretty, pretty humble beginnings. That was once they started paying themselves, you know. So pretty humble beginnings. Um, so that's about when I came on. Um, I was a student. I'd done a few internships. You know, I was your typical, I had 100 bucks in my bank account, 100 bucks in my bank account when I, uh, when I joined job. I knew I needed, like, some kind of income. Um, I had done the, uh, you know, I talked to the financial groups, Goldman, and I talked to the accounting groups, Ernst & Young, and I just wanted to do a, something a little more entrepreneurial. Um, and uh, I applied for Jive and, and got the internship. It worked out really well because my previous internship had used a similar technology, but the, the old way, kind of your, your on-site, lots of hardware, and moving that to the cloud, that made sense to me, right? What doesn't make sense to move the cloud today? So yeah, I'll, I'll do that. Uh, maybe a little naive, but it uh, worked out. So I did some internships. Um, I'll skip a few, a few of those stories, but uh, my recruiting lunch. So I did my internship, went really well. Um, came time for my recruiting lunch. They wanted me to stay. I had a couple of job offers. Um, you know, their job offer was significantly like half or less than you know, some of my other offers. And so we went to Wendy's, of course. Um, it was a shorter drive, less gas money. And uh, we get there, and Mike, who's one of the founders and, and my first boss, he like jumps in lines and like pays for himself and scoots up there. And, and John, who's the current CEO, is like, you're gonna, you know, you're like trying to make him pay for his own lunch. So I did. I paid for my own lunch at Wendy's at my recruiting lunch, um, and uh, and kind of went from there. And during that time, I remember talking with John, and we were, you know, discussing what, you know, whether I should come on full time. And you know, he said, well, um, one thing you got to keep in mind here is is the team. He's like, we've got a good team, and, and um, you know. No matter what you end up doing, you know, if you stay with us, uh, if this doesn't turn out, you know, we'll do something else and you'll still be part of the team. And I'm like, yeah, I like that. You know, these were good guys. It was a good range. You had a guy that like broke 700 on the GMAT and didn't even study for it. You're like, all right, you, you know, he's your smart guy. And then you've got John, who uh, our CEO, I probably shouldn't say this because this is recorded, but, you know, at least at the time, hadn't graduated to college yet. Um, and, uh, but he'd done a few businesses. Another guy had done a few businesses. You know, they had some experience. Um, so a bunch of, you know, some, some smart guys, some experienced guys, and just, you know, good dude. They treated their wives well. My wife, Emily, is here. 
Um, I, spy, I wasn't married. In fact, I was the butt of so many jokes for so long because I wasn't married. But, um, but it just seemed like a good group. So I was like, yeah, the team is good. I'm going to join this good team. And uh, you know, it kind of worked out. My first big project was um, uh, the CEO asked me uh, about like, our cash. He wanted me to come in and present something on budget. And uh, he wanted it the next day. And I was like, well, if you want like a real forecast, and that's like not just a single spreadsheet. So I stayed up all night. I got a pizza. I, was, I think I was up till 4 AM. And the next day I present, okay, you know, here's your six founders, here's your budgets, and this is how it rolls into a P&L and balance sheet and cash flow statement. And by the way, your cash is going like this, and we want it to go like this. And, uh, you know, and that was just no, none of them had spent time on this because they had all, you know, all had other things that they were doing. And so I ended up being able to be a, kind of in a key role on the finance side, the first finance guy, and, um, and kind of went from there. And that was, you know, my first really big project. And after that meeting, the CEO wanted me to come to every single strategic meeting they had. So from that, there was a founding group and Sam, you know, and that was kind of, that's how it's been for the last nine years. So that was pretty cool. And I liked kind of being with, with the team and, and uh, kind of being high level. It was really fun. Uh, my greatest accomplishment was not being the butt of those jokes anymore and getting Emily to marry the payroll guy at some no-name startup. That's what her ex-boyfriend said when, you know, she started dating me. Um, and it was all true, so I was like, yeah, that's pretty much it. But I did get her to commit that if I made $25,000 a year for the rest of my life, she would be okay with that. So I was like, okay, all right, this will work. You know, I can keep you happy. I think I can do that, and, uh, and we'll be good. Yeah, she said, and a plan. She said, and a plan. But I like to leave that part out. And a man with a plan. Yeah, I like, I like to leave that part out. It sounds better. Um, so that was my greatest, you know, best sales job I've ever done. So some of the takeaways, um, you know, uh, that you know, if, if I were to give you advice, which, you know, caveat, this is my experience. I'm sure your experience is very different. This is general advice, and you know, every situation is different. So don't, I don't assume to know where you're at, but this is what I've, some of the things I've learned. But to join and build a team that wants you to be successful. The guys that I joined, they wanted me to be successful. That's been a key part of my success. I was on a team they wanted me to win. Um, and I wanted them to win. And I think that really helped, you know, throughout our history together is helping each other win. Um, become invaluable by doing the work that no one else wants to do. Uh, in a startup, there's a lot of work that, you know, is grunt work, manual labor, you know. It's not, it's not exciting stuff. And, and that's all right. That's kind of the phase, at least in the early days, of, of where you might be at. And uh, we actually took this as a principle as a company, and we applied it in some pretty cool ways where we tackled markets that were uh, heavy, heav heavily regulated, lots of complex tax. Telecom has like 2,000 taxing jurisdictions in the US. Um, and we tackled some complicated, or not necessarily complicated, but kind of messy um, spaces, markets. And we did really well and kind of you know, ran the table in, in certain markets because of our willingness to kind of go after the, uh, you know, the messy stuff, the hard stuff. And the last thing um, is what you're working on right now is what you'll be working on tomorrow. So I had uh, I'd done a few internships. Internships meant jobs for me. Um, the internships I'd done led directly into my, my job at Jive. Um, I think one of my friends today is a CEO at a company called Podium. Uh, I don't know if you heard of Podium, but they're doing awesome stuff. They just raised 35 million bucks. And when we were roommates, he was always you know, trying new ideas. And, and I, I didn't think any of them were, were you know, amazing per se. Uh, but it doesn't surprise me that today he's got a great business um, because he was always trying, you know. He, had, he didn't hit the gold uh, when I was with him, when we were roommates, but, but he got there. It doesn't surprise me that he's, he's running a company right now just because of his pattern, uh, the pattern of his life. Um, so with that, that's a little bit about Jive and, and myself. Um, thought I'd move into kind of fundraising and acquisitions. This is where I spent a lot of time. Um, I thought it might be interesting to, to you guys as aspiring entrepreneurs. So. Um, a little bit about my experience here. I've sourced over 150 million in term sheets, uh, basically offers to, to buy you know, or invest in our company. Um, that's on the sell side where I'm sitting in front of investors and trying to pitch them on why they should you know, buy Jive or invest in Jive. And on the other side, we've done six acquisitions. Um, uh, so I've, I've been on the other side of the table where you've got an investment banker who's trying to sell a company or I'm talking to the company itself and they're pitching me on their metrics and why they're awesome. Um, and so these are you know, some takeaways I've learned as I've been through this. Um, I might add, too, that I was on the growth equity side. Uh, or we, we got to a, um, doing $25 million a year in revenue, so we're, which is a little larger. So there's kind of venture capital and growth equity. Venture capital is typically $10 million and lower in revenue. It's a little more concept-driven. 
But once you get above 10 million, you're a little more proven and growth equity is more for fuel on the fire. You know, you've got a proven track where you know what you're doing and you kind of, you want to raise money to add fuel to the fire. So that's where we were um, when we raised money. Um, maybe a couple more comments around this. My first, the first money I raised was, uh, was debt and it was from a bank and that was by far the toughest. I mean, I called 100, 200 different institutions. No one knew who I was. No one knew who any of the founders was. No one came for money on the founding group. Um, we didn't have any rich tools that we could leverage, uh, you know, to put some money in that liked us enough anyway. Um, so, you know, we were really kind of on our own and we didn't have a resume or anything to really back us up. Our business was a software business, so we didn't have a hard asset. We'd be like, hey, look at, yeah, just lend against this building we own. We didn't have that. Um, our, our value was in our customer base that so they pay us every month, but you know, so just a, it was a tough, that first sell was definitely my, my toughest. And I, you know, I definitely learned a lot after going through that. So these are some of the things I learned as I, as I went through raising money. Um, the first is always get an intro to whoever you want to talk to. It goes so much better. There's a, there's a few reasons for that. Um, one is as you network, network, and network, you can create a buzz and you can end up, um, people that you didn't talk to can end up coming back around. So one example is Goldman. Um, Goldman, they have an emerging markets group. They're in New York. Uh, I'd never talked to him. I didn't call him, but I've been working with a bunch of different people. I talked to some different investment bankers, and uh, one of them, Dave Castagna from uh, Raymond James, talked to Goldman about one, one guy at Goldman that happened to be looking for a company in our space, but, oh, yeah, you should check out this company in Utah. It's called Jive. We're not a company that because of uh, kind of just who we are, bootstrap for the most part. We didn't spend a lot in PR. No one really knew who we were, so we're pretty quiet. So. That was really fortuitous. So this, you know, Goldman, great brand, great company. They come knocking, hey, we heard you guys do unified communications. Can we talk to you about investing in your company? Yes, please. So that was awesome. Um, another point, a reason to, to get an intro is by getting an intro, somebody else is recommending you already. You've already got a, you know, the person that might invest in your business has a second, third party kind of validation of, of what you're doing. And that's pretty awesome. One uh, point to pair with that, is friends speak each other's language. So that first debt deal we did was, was, was with uh, Silicon Valley Bank. And um, we had, a, you know, went through the deal, closed, got some debt, and they introduced us to Northbridge, who, who is our, our, our current investor, Northbridge Growth Equity. They're a $3.2 billion fund out of Boston. And when they had that intro call, I was on the call, and, and Gary was our contact SVB. He's talking to Geraldine, who's, uh, you know, she went to Harvard. She's super smart, very intimidating. And, uh, you know, she's a Northbridge big fund. You know, we're like really wanting this money. And, um, and he's, like, he's like, oh, man, jive. He's like, their, their metrics are just awesome. It's like these guys, and he just starts selling the company in a, in a way that I'd never sold it and from an angle that I'd never really pitched it. And I couldn't necessarily do that, but he could because he was the bank. They knew us really well. And so he just kind of pitches them for us. And it's just like, oh, perfect. So I got this third party, totally respected, that's vouching for me. And it made it just so much easier. So that, you know, that's kind of point number one. Um, another point, and this is actually, Mark Cuban said it on Shark Tank. I don't know if you guys like Shark Tank, but my wife and I sometimes enjoy watching Shark Tank. And he said, never spurn someone who offers you money for your business. Um, you know, let gratitude rule the day. Be, be thankful. Even if you think it's a super low ball offer, um, there's just ways that it can turn out if you, if you just kind of express gratitude for it. Um, you know, your business is, uh, your, not you, your business is worth what someone is willing to pay for it. And um, uh, so a couple points around this. So in our first uh, Series A, the first round of capital that we raised, um, we actually got an offer for someone that seemed kind of low, but it was our first one and we're like, oh, okay, you know, that's fine. And, and instead of being like, ah, forget it or kind of getting offended or, or turning away from the relationship, we kept talking with them, kept talking with them, and uh, they ended up being our first anchor for a bidder, right? We had some competition. Ended up getting a few more groups in, and by the end, we had more than tripled the valuation that we got for our first investment. And you know, I attribute that to being willing to accept the fact that someone wants to offer you. Now on the flip side, a couple of years later, uh, one of these groups that had been in the first round that didn't get in were like, hey, you guys missed out. We're raising again. You should definitely come in. Remember, you were low last time, so you might want to be a little higher this time. And uh, they came in. They came in with an offer that we still thought was low. Um, but it, for them, we knew it was high. And we're like, you know, inside, we're, we were a little bit like, ah, oh, man, not necessarily offended, but a little bit, maybe a little bit offended. And like, ah, oh, we thought I was going to be higher and, you know, whatever, and forget those guys. And, um, you know, we weren't mean or anything, but... Um, you know, just kind of let it fizzle. And uh, it turns out a year later, we raised for a lower valuation than what they'd offered. 
because the market shifted. Our, our public comparables suddenly shrunk, and now we didn't have this anchor of this high value anymore uh, because the market changed. Um, and, and then we were like, oh shoot, we should have been really nice to those guys and kept them in, you know, in the wheelhouse because that actually would be great. And actually a year ago, that was good given the market we're in today. Um, so kind of, you know, two different sides of the coin there. Um, you know, last point around this is, there's no, if you have somebody else in the mix, then there's no point to get offended. If you get offended, it's almost a signal that, signal to a buyer investor that you don't have anybody else. Um, one example is we were looking at an acquisition um, end of last year. I flew out to Canada, look at this Canada company. Pretty cool company, great team, really liked, it, really liked them. But we had a, a, an investment thesis that we were using for this business and we kind of gave them an offer that we, was kind of our max. It was like the highest we could go. We thought it was pretty good. And uh, I remember as we were leaving, the investment banker runs out and he was like, hey, hey. Um, so this is our, you know, the guy that's trying to sell the business for this cool team and he's like, hey, so it'd be great if like, you know, your valuation was like higher and there was more cash. And we're like, thanks. Says, you know, that's really helpful. Uh, we'll, we'll take that into consideration. Uh, what that signaled to me was they had no other buyer, right? I mean, if that's all you come back with was we want you to pay more and give us more cash, then I was like, okay, well, they, they must not have another buyer. I'm not going to counter at a higher valuation. I'm going to leave it as it is. And so we did that, and um, they didn't take it. They said, okay, well, we're going to go, you know, you know that, that's too low and blah, blah, blah. I came back six months later, and they said, actually, we do want to do that deal. And by that time, now we know, okay, you don't have another bidder for sure. And actually, you know, now where we're at, we don't really want to offer the same valuation. In fact, we don't know that we want to buy you anymore. And, our, and there were some internal reasons why that changed. We had some different priorities. We took some of that funding and we invested in organic growth instead of trying to buy this, um, this other business. And so I think they kind of missed it. I think they're kind of kicking themselves. So kind of a few different ways that, um, you know, always be grateful when someone validates your business. Even if it's a small valuation, that's okay. They're wanting to buy it. And that's a great start. Um, so moving on, uh, next point, smart people are dumb too. Um, I, I was pretty intimidated by you know, some of the Harvard, Wharton, you know, Stanford guys and, and gals, and, um, and a lot of them were smart, but I always remember talking to, to one guy that went to Harvard. He was one of my mentors. I reached out locally to try and find other CFO mentors that I could learn from, and, and, and one, of, one, of, uh, one of these guys was awesome. He worked at a, a really big private equity group, really great experience, big fund. And uh, I was talking to him at lunch one time, just, you know, my mentorship lunch, and he was like, he was like, yeah, I, I hated being in private equity groups. And I'm like, why would you hate being around lots of money? And he was like, he was like, I was always the dumbest guy in the room. And I'm like, you went to Harvard. He's like, yeah, but I never knew anything about the businesses that I was trying to invest in. He's like, I'd ask questions, but that was mostly just to, to you know, sound like I knew what I was talking about. But I didn't actually, I never knew the business as well as they did. And I was so happy to jump from the investing side to the business side and actually know the business really well and actually know what I was talking about. And that's the first time the light bulb kind of went on for me that was, you know what, I actually know my business. You know, as you guys run your businesses, you know your business better than anyone. So when you're in front of these groups and trying to pitch your, uh, these investors, you're going to know better than them. You can be 100% confident in kind of the answers you give, even if like they're getting nitpicky and they're trying to, you know, uh, in really smart ways kind of, uh, you know, pinpoint faults or weaknesses. You guys know your, you'll, you'll know your business. You guys and gals, you'll know your businesses and you'll be able to answer very smart. And that's something that I had to learn uh, over time. Um, people are only as smart as their weakest assumption. So uh, I love this example. It's not actually a Jive example, but I'm gonna use it anyway. Um, there's an example, I think it's Progressive, an insurance company. They had this issue with, um, with claims and having to pay a bunch with claims and with PR. Uh, their PR was getting negative reviews because all these claims were taking so long to process and then they weren't always awarding the claims to people filing insurance claims. It was just this big mess. So they called this big meeting and they said, all right, we want everyone to come in and bring your best solutions. Let's talk about uh, you know, how to solve the, this claim and filing issue. So they all come in and a junior analyst comes in and they're going around and they ask the junior analyst, you know, what, what do you think? And he says, well, actually, he's like, I don't, I don't think we should even do, do the claim process. And they're like, ah, get out of here. We, we want solutions here. We're not interested in, you know, you know, junior analysts with dumb ideas. So send him out. A few hours later, they say, actually, let's bring him back in. They say, okay, what did you mean by that? And he said, well, I was looking through the math, doing the math on everything, and we pay more legal fees than we would if we just paid all the claims. So why don't we just pay all the claims, quit going through the fuss, and uh, they were like, you know, blew their minds. They did some additional research, verified that he was totally right. 
the claims were worth costing more, uh, the, the, the legal fees on the claims were costing more than the claims themselves. They changed to a simple validation where they just said, okay, if the other party agrees that this is what happened, then we'll just pay the claim. And they completely changed their business model off of that one junior analyst who decided to make a good assumption you know, on, well, should we even be doing this? You know, should we even be going through this whole process? Pretty cool, it's also kind of a finance guy thing, so I was like, yeah, I like that one. Um, the last thing is that uh, generally strengths accompany weaknesses. One of my good friends is a, is a um, psychologist. He's worked with you know, couples, divorced couples, happy couples, every, everything. And one of the things that he talks about is when couples fall in love, they fall in love with each other's strengths. But over time, the weaknesses start nagging at them. And what they don't realize always is that those weaknesses are directly correlated with those strengths. And so if you love the strengths, you gotta, kinda gotta put up with the weaknesses. And I think that, you know, with, with Drive, that's certainly been the case. We've got a lot of really smart guys that are good at certain things, but they're not good at other things. I'm terrible with sales. I'm not creative. Sterling won't let me touch anything in marketing. Um, graphics, you know, I'm colorblind, so that doesn't help, right? So, uh, so that's, you know, one, one of the lessons I learned is that, um, you know, smart people are dumb too. I'm dumb in a lot of ways, and, and that's okay. That's why you've got a team. Um, to work with. Uh, last one, I, I'm sure you've heard, he who has the gold makes the rules. So uh, I was on a call with, so I've, at this point in my career, I'd raised, uh, raised money a few times. I was pretty comfortable with, with my ability to do so with the company. You know, we had a little more, uh, pre, more of a presence, people have heard of us. And uh, we were talking with a bank, and the banker says to me, you know, they're trying to get my business, and they say, well, you know, why do you want to leave your other bank? And I'm like, well, they've actually been pretty good, but if I could change anything, I'd loosen up this covenant, and I'd want a little more flexibility here, and, you know, I kind of list some things that would be a little nicer. And he's like, well, you know what they say? And I'm like, no, what do they say? He's like, he who has the gold makes the rules. And I was like, aren't you trying to get my business? Like, don't you want me to switch from this lender that I actually like, this bank, I actually like them. They're just some things I would prefer. And you're telling me that you're gonna make all the rules? No, you know, that's totally flawed. And I think this is more accurate. He who makes the gold today makes the rules. You think of Buffett, Gates, Bezos, you know, from Amazon. These are the guys, they, they, they write their own destiny. They're, they're not the ones that are on the weak side of the negotiation table, right? Because they're wealth creators. And in our economy today, where there's a plentiful supply of capital, people like you, entrepreneurs that can create wealth, can take money and make more out of it, you're the ones in demand. Um, and so I, that was, a, you know, that was a, a, a moment in time when my, my thinking shifted and I thought, no, actually, you know, Jive, we're creating money. We're adding jobs. We are creating new technology. Um, we're making the gold. And, and we, we get to determine to some extent, you know, what the rules are. Um, investors generally, they're just providing capital. They don't actually know your business. They don't, they're not the ones that are running a business. That's, that's the entrepreneurs. Um, and today, like I mentioned, kind of a duplicate point, but access to capital has never been better. Um, yeah, we can move on. Let's see, anything else on that one? Okay, so lastly, I think I've got a few more minutes. So managing the day-to-day, -day, here are just some things that uh, kind of help me as I, as I manage my day-to-day. -day. I started off with just myself. I didn't have any employees. Now I've got a little over 60 employees. And uh, sometimes it you know, gets tough juggling everything. Um, and then seek out mentors. I mentioned uh, you know, the, um, the CFO that I met up with for lunch. There have been a few CFOs in Utah Valley that have just been awesome for me. I really appreciate them. It was huge for me um, as, a, as a young guy um, you know, in my 20s, running a finance company was pretty stressful. People's payroll depended on me. There was some days where we had to go from bank to bank, get all the money, cash we could, to put into the bank to hit payroll. I mean, it was like, we were tight. I never missed a payroll, but um, you know, I really appreciated those that took time out for me. I encourage you um, to take time out to mentor others as well. Um, I'm sure there's a lot that you could teach um, other aspiring entrepreneurs or entrepreneurs. Um, it, it's definitely made a difference in my life. Um, the best leaders make everyone smarter, be a multiplier. I don't think I'm the best example of this, but I've seen it in my company. I've got some employees who have um, some on my team that have employees and they're just awesome. It, you know, people move to their teams and suddenly they're rock stars. And, uh, and I, you know, that's one thing that I, I wish I was better at, but as I've seen that enabling people to be, um, to be their full selves, to reach their full potential, removing roadblocks I think is, is a pretty key part of management. Something that I aspire to do and try to do 
and I think it's made a huge difference um, in, in Jive. Uh, you know, you've heard your greatest asset is your people team. I really believe that. And the more you can leverage, um, it's like, you know, for a finance guy, it's like if you can leverage someone, you're paying them the same payroll. If you can help them do more, oh, and that's, you know, infinite. Um, I'm a warrior. I worry all the time. So I really like, uh, I've read a book a few times by Dale Carnegie, Dale Carnegie called uh, How to Stop Worrying and Start Living. Um, yeah, I mean, maybe you've read it too, it sounds like. And uh, one of the things he talks about in there is the hourglass. And, you know, sometimes I feel like, man, I've got 60, you know, over 60 employees and they all need stuff and I just don't have time to talk to them and I've got to do this and man, you know, this is just crazy and it's a headache and um, I get really stressed out. One thing that helped me deal with it was this concept of the hourglass and recognizing that only one grain of sand can go through that funnel at the same, you know, at the moment in time. So the idea was to kind of embrace the moment, you know, recognize that, yep, there's a whole bunch of crap you gotta do tomorrow. There's a whole bunch of other people you gotta talk to, but right now you've got your employee that you're working with and they need your help. Right now they need you to remove from some roadblocks. And this concept helped me as I deal with um, different priorities and projects. To recognize, yep, I've got a mountain of stuff to do, but I'm human. I've only got so much time in my day, and this right now is what I can do, and I'm just not gonna worry about the rest. There's a few other things in the book that really helped me, but um, I thought that, you know, for me was useful and, and hopefully maybe useful for you. So do you do one thing at a time, or do you sometimes do two or three things at a time? I'm not a multitasker. For me personally, I absolutely cannot multitask. My wife, she's agreeing with me on that. Cannot chew gum and wash dishes. <laughs> <laughs> can't, chew, chan, can't chew gum and wash dishes. So, you know, that's about as bad as it gets. Yeah, but you do have a list of priorities and things to get done. Yeah, I absolutely. I list priorities for sure, and uh, I go through them. Um, yeah, you know, pretty much one at a time, yeah. Um, the last thing I'll mention is that, um, this is a quote by Clayton Christensen. He's, uh, if you don't know who he is, he's an incredible thinker. He's voted like number one thinker in you know, business by you know, different studies. He wrote Innovator's Dilemma, uh, which is a, a very innovative uh, um, book on how to think about entrepreneurship. If you haven't read it, I definitely would. Um, but he says, he, he wrote a book called How You Measure Your Life. So this quote is, how you measure your life if the decisions you make about where you invest your blood, sweat, and tears are not consistent with the person you aspire to be, you'll never become that person. Um, so, you know, one thing that was important to me is, is to obtain success both at work but also at home. One thing I loved about the founding team is that they treated their wives well, they, had, they treated their kids well, they had, um, they had a good outside of work environment, they cared about the community. We have a, a Jive Foundation where we try and give back, we do 10 acts of service. Um, a year, 12? 10. Sterling's our PR guy, he knows his stuff. 10 acts of service a year, and um, you know, we care, we wanna give back. Uh, that's kind of the group we're in, that's where I personally get happiness out of, is stuff like that. So for me, it was important to be part of a team and a culture that cares about those kinds of things. Um, and so I'd encourage you as, you, as you prioritize, you have to allocate resources, right? I mean, especially entrepreneurs, like, entrepreneurs are the busiest people out there. And uh, if you don't deliberately segment your day and figure out you know, what you're gonna do when and carve out time for specific things, it's, it's really hard to, uh, to make sure you're balancing everything. Life will never be in balance, I think. I think it's always gonna be out of balance, but we can do things to keep it as in balance as possible. Um, so that's what I had. Uh, appreciate you, you know, listening uh, to, to what I had to share and um, open it up to any kind of questions you have. So how do you motivate yourself do the things that need to be done, but you don't feel like doing it. How do you get the motivation to get that done? Yeah, that's a good one. Sometimes I actually need a break. You know, I need to just take a quick walk or something to step out if I can't, you know, if I'm in a funk. That was actually me last night, as I had a, you know, we were trying to get a budget for 2018 out, and then I have to do this, and I just needed a quick break, a uh, men mental break. Um, uh, I list out my projects. I go through them one at a time. I rank them in priority. Um, you know, it's hard to tackle a big list, but I can tackle one thing, you know. So I like to prioritize um, and just go through. Um, and you don't find yourself skipping to the things you find more exciting? Uh, sometimes if, it's, if I'm not on a time crunch, I might do that just to change the pace up a little bit. Um, you know, sometimes it helps to do something that's a little easier and then come back, you know, maybe to the spreadsheet that I've been working on all day, just to break, break up the, um, just give my mind a break on spreadsheet stuff and work on something else. But you get her done, right? Isn't but yeah, but, but get her done, yeah. Having a team has been huge. Um, you know, uh, 
I mean, having employees has made just a huge difference. I, I know with, you know, at least at Jive, we always tried to hire, for a long time, we hired really cheap, you know, just the cheapest resource we could find. And over time, we've had to kind of, I think, change that a little bit and try and hire talent. And uh, it's tough, I think, sometimes to balance, you know, trying to go cost effective versus someone that, you, even though they, they might cost more, they actually free you up a ton just because of their capability to do more. So having employees that are talented are, are, has been huge for me so that I can actually, as appropriate, delegate stuff. Sometimes I can't do everything. So having a team you have confidence in, you can delegate. My accounting guy is awesome. I have a business intelligence person. They're awesome. Payroll. Um, I used to have legal. I had an awesome general counsel, and now he's his own department, and that's great. HR, like all of those things have been really great to be able to offload to someone capable. So to the extent you can, you know, delegate for sure. How do you set realistic fiscal goals? How do you state realistic fiscal goals for your company? Yeah. Um, you involve everyone, you know, so at Jive, kind of our process is, uh, you know, we'll, we'll talk with each sales leader about their goals for the next year, what they need to get there. Um, we look at, uh, you know, in my experience, those guys are really optimistic, you know, like, oh yeah, we're gonna triple sales next year, it's gonna be awesome, like, yeah, you gotta fund this, 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 and we need a sponsorship to NASCAR, <laughs> and, uh, you know, and, and we'll deliver, man, we'll deliver. <laughs> and they're great sales guys, you know, and you wanna believe them, but, you know, so, it's kind of taking, talking with them, seeing what they wanna do, and then also looking at our historicals and how have we done historically versus, um, you know, plan. Um, uh, and really it's just going through team by team we talk with support what do you guys need to support a business that grows so first it's usually sales so first we start with sales what are we going to grow other segments of the business what does it take to support growth like this and kind of go through each segment of the business um, and then and then as we go we do a rolling forecast so every month we're updating it and we and we can toggle back hey we're not hitting this growth number we need to toggle back you know we're not going to hire these salespeople we work closely with HR HR knows what our plan is and so we're always in sync on whether or not we should hire or whether or not, uh, or, or if we need to accelerate. If we're doing awesome, yeah, we gotta hire more support people because sales is you know, blown out of the roof. So I think it's a pretty involved effort. Get everyone involved, get, get what their plan is. We like to set up a year um, plan just so that everyone has a roadmap they can kind of plan for the year with the understanding that that might adjust throughout the year as you know, we either grow quicker or slower. Do you do a three-year plan also? We have a three-year plan, but our real focus is the next year. So kind of the rolling year. What's your threshold as far as the, the, the equity ratio? Debt's equity ratio, as much debt as we can get in the early days, right? It's like, hey, whatever you give us, we'll take, baby, you know? We are negative equity, so uh, yeah. in the early days, it, uh, we, I mean, we really had, you know, didn't really have equity, so, so we would take as much debt as we could get. Um, uh, in our business, uh, growth is what's valued the most, right? Because the quicker you can grow, that just means you have more customers paying you. Um, we're a recurring revenue business. Customers pay us every month just like you would for your phone bill. Um, and so, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't say that there's, I'd say more than optimizing for a debt to equity ratio, we're optimizing for growth and trying to be responsible. But um, we actually look at everything on a unit economic basis. How much did it cost us to get a single customer? And did that make sense? And then if we need more debt, we'll get more debt to keep doing that. So I'm probably not the best person to ask because I, <laughs> I'm pretty terrible with relationships. It took me, you know, 10 years to get Emily to marry me, you know. So, um, but I would just, I mean, I was, I'd go on LinkedIn, I'd see who knew this person, I'd ping him and say, hey, I want to intro to this person, you know, and I, I was pretty aggressive. I don't know if that's the best approach. You know, that's why she didn't marry me for so long. Um, but I, you know, I'd go after it. I, I didn't, I wasn't shy. Um, you know, I would just talk to people, talk to people, talk to people, try and get an intro. And what I generally, I would go to LinkedIn, see who had the best connection, and I'd talk to them and say, hey, you know, I'm, we're trying to do this, I'm looking for an intro to this. And I'd obviously try and use my best relationship that I could, that knew me the best or knew Jive the best to, to get that intro. But I didn't wait, I mean, I went after it. If I didn't know somebody, but I saw that I was connected to somebody that was connected to somebody, I'd go make friends with that person, like today, and try and get the intro. Um, <coughs> 
you know, for us getting capital was a big part of our growth and the quicker we could do it, the faster we could grow. So yeah, I, I wasn't shy. I mean, I'm sure you could be more strategic and depending on your timeline, maybe it makes sense. For us, it, it, we were trying to move quick. So. Yeah, I mean, we had a lot of struggles. There's a lot of challenges in, in a business. Uh, we've had all different kinds of challenges. Um, uh, you know, one of the most recent challenges is we had a, we went after this government segment that was, you know, that our competitors didn't want to go in after, and they, the government changed the rules. They, they, they changed how a subsidy works. That completely changed our business model, and we had to adjust. So. Um, you know, uh, I think we, we try and be pretty objective, try and be data-driven. We're a very, very data-driven company. That's something that I actually really enjoy. We have a business intelligence team. We try and look at the data, look at trends, and see what's going on. And we try and be a bit objective. It's tough, especially when you, you have people that have worked on, on your company for a long time. Sometimes we've had to change out talent, bring in new talent. That's hard. Um, it's hard to do that when that means, you know, losing people that have helped you build a company. Fortunately, we haven't had to do a ton of that. We've had really awesome employee retention. Um, but I, I think you have to be objective about the challenges you're facing and decide how you, know, how you can address them. Uh, to the extent you get good data, uh, which we've cared about, we've tracked for a long time, it, it'll totally help inform the decision. Um, you know, one thing we've done too, we had a while where our onboarding wasn't as awesome as we liked it to be. We had a business intelligence team, a guy named Ricky, he's, he's the man, he's awesome. And he just loves that stuff. He wears the Arizona hat every day to work. You know, if, he's wearing, if it's a suit coat day, it's still an Arizona hat with a suit coat. And uh, he just went after it. What's, you know, what's going on here? What, what are customers seeing? What are the issues? And he tracked it, and then he came back with data, and we said, oh, okay. And we started fixing those things, so, um, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? It sounds like you guys have a pretty good, like, culture within the business. Um, you work well together and everything. How, how did you build that? Yeah, I think uh, you know it started by having a good founding team at the beginning. I think they they created a good culture. They had a good culture between themselves. Um, when it came to hiring, we uh, you know tried to hire referrals most of the time. Um, we've got a great team out in Canada that's like 99% referrals. And uh, so we have awesome talent there. And because we've created a good working environment, they're going out and getting their friends and associates and people they knew that were top talent. Um, so uh, you know, I think part of the key, especially as you expand, if you expand internationally, we, we, we're in Guatemala and we're in Canada and you know, a few other Brazil. As you expand, if you can make sure to get that great first talent starting, you, know, you start a department, a marketing department. You know, Sterling's our head of PR. If you can land that first great person that's then gonna help you build that program, I think that's, that's a big key, is making sure that first hire in whatever department it is, is a strong hire, a talented hire. That'll really help set your culture for that team. How do you identify and deal with the threats to your agency or department? Uh, let's see, Sterling badmouths everybody. That, no, I'm just kidding. Um, that is a good question. Uh, so, for example, in our space, there's, there's a lot of big companies. So at and is huge, Verizon is huge. We go head-to-head -head with those guys for business. Um, there's some other companies that are, are like us where they're cloud-based, their technology's in the cloud. Um, and uh, I think in some cases, we just don't go fight them. We pick a space where they're not, just like that, you know, example with that government program. Uh, sometimes we fight them, and sometimes we try and pick a route that doesn't involve them because it's easier. Well, you don't have competition, you're probably going to win, right? Uh, so definitely do that when you can. And then when you've got to go head to head, uh, you know, we've done battle cards in the past to try and figure out, okay, where are they strong and where are we weak and where can we sell against them and win? Um, so I think there's a, a number of strategies there. Um, so a lot of our competitors, some of our competitors are about the same size, raised 400 million bucks. We've only invested 20 million in primary in the capital to get the same size. Um, so I think, uh, you know, we just approach things differently. We try to be very strategic about our long-term plan and balance long and short. I think some of our competitors decided to, uh, to grow as quickly as possible at all costs. And, um, and they're much, you know, bigger, 
but, um, but I took a lot of capital to get there. So I think it depends on the problems and challenges you're facing um, as to kind of what approach you want to take. Any other questions? Maybe we'll get a copy of your presentation. Yeah, if, if you take a copy, I'm happy to send it to you. Not a problem. And, and, and let me add too, if, um, if any of you would, uh, you know, intros, you know, to your intro question, if, if you would like intros, please feel free to ping me, or, or if I can help in any way, I'd be, I'd be more than happy to. Um, you know, not that, you know, again, my, my experience is limited to what my experience is, but um, for me, it's been very helpful at least to have, you know, one more person in the network that might know somebody else. I'd be happy to, to help if I can. You had a question? Yeah, so we've learned a lot of So we did, we did it on a unit basis. So we'd, we'd get as small as we can and say, was it worth what it took to get that customer? Right, that's the question. For all we spent in marketing and sales, to get the customer, did it make sense? So, um, you know, we pay, you know, rough math, we pay between 300, depending on the segment, 300 bucks to 500 bucks just to get one person to use and pay for our subscription every month. So we, we knew that math even early on. We, we, we figured out how much it cost us to get a customer. And then we said, okay, well, if they pay us every month for 12 months, do we, do we break even? How long does it take us to break even? And, um, and so then we knew how much capital we needed to raise. We knew if it made sense. That's also, by the way, how you pitch an investor, right? You kind of got to be able to, if it, if it doesn't make sense to, um, if it doesn't make sense to you, it's not going to make sense to an investor, right? And so you have to be able to kind of go through, um, at least on the math side, right? The math side and say, hey, if we do this, will it make sense at the, you know, at the, at the smallest unit basis on a unit um, economics level, does it make sense? And if it does, then, you know, I'd pour money on it. I'd raise money. I'd, you know, I'd borrow debt, you know, if, uh, if it makes sense. Sam and his team for coming out and speaking with us today. These are really great opportunities and we hope to keep continuing to do them. Um, just a few housekeeping things. Um, I would like to thank Young Subaru for sponsoring these events. That's really a valuable thing for us. And we also like to thank the Entrepreneurship Club for helping set up for these events. Also, this building is really awesome that Weaver State provides us to do these things. Um, let all your friends and family know of our upcoming events, if this is something you want to keep continue to come to, uh, just spend